Judges chapter 14 and verse 1, when you find it, shall praise the Lord. It will be on your screen for your convenience, but we always ask you to bring your word. That way you're able to follow along in the Bible. Judges 14 and verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me. Look at your neighbor and tell him, get her for me. Get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of the brethren, of thy brethren, among my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me. Say that again. Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Today we're going to continue in our summer series that we started last Sunday morning entitled Blinded Success, Blinded Success. And we are going to leave off, or we're going to begin where we left off last Sunday morning, okay? So if you haven't heard last Sunday morning's message, you can always go on myglc.org and you can find the recorded version of our services. Take your neighbor by the hand as a point of contact and a sign of unity, and let's ask God's blessings. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for this word. Let the word go forth in power and in demonstration of your spirit, a powerful seed planted in good ground to bring forth much fruit. Holy Spirit, we're thankful that you're here in this room. Continue to lead and guide and direct us. Bring all things back to remembrance. What service has been spoken, what service has been written. Give us the insight for eyesight. Open our ears that we may hear what you are saying to the church. When we will leave this place, we will bear much fruit. And God, I pray, Lord, honor us, God. Confirm your word with signs and wonders. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says, amen and amen. God bless you. We have people watching from Kansas City. Um, uh, Kansas, or excuse me, Kansas City, Missouri, also Batesville, Arkansas, and Paragol, Arkansas. We shout out to people that are watching uh, throughout this nation. I want to pick up where I left off last Sunday morning talking about blinded success. Blinded success. Sitting in hospice care just a few days before losing her battle with pancreatic cancer, Emily Phillips called over her husband and their two grown children. She opened up her laptop and read the obituary she had written for herself. And at the end of her obituary, she wrote these words. I was born, I blinked, and it was all over. No buildings named after me, no monuments erected in my honor, but I did have the chance to know and love each and every friend as well as my family members. How much more blessed can a person be? We left last Sunday morning and we were talking about the truth of our lives. We are all terminal. There's no doubt about it. Scripture tells us that it is appointed for man to die then the judgment. Unless we go by the rapture, and that's been my prayer for some time now, we will all face the grave. We will all face death. There's no doubt about it. And it's what we do here on this earth is what's so important for us. And I love what James chapter 4 and verse 14 says. It says, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? What is your life? Maybe that is something that we need to ponder on right now. What is my life today? What is it about? What is my life? He says it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So we summed up last Sunday morning saying that eternity is too long to be wrong. There's so much truth in it is. And so let's, let's go back and, and the foundation that we have laid. And we're talking about blinded success. And perhaps maybe you're here this morning and you're wondering, what in the world is a blinded success? What, is that, what does that mean? And this is our definition, and it'll be on your screen. Blinded success is the inability to see God's truth in the midst of our prosperity. I'm going to say that one more time. It is the inability to see God's truth in the midst of our prosperity. And our life point that we've been using is this. Success is not always God's endorsement of you and your life. 
And we, I, think, I think that when we continue to drive this home, it will, and, and allow it to take resident in our life, it'll help us to get a new perspective of, of the call and the election that God has placed upon us and realize that there are some things in life that really are meaningless, but there are other things that are meaningful. And so Matthew 16 and 26 says this, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Those are great questions, great things to ponder about today. And as we continue this series of Blinded Success, today our uh, assignment is to cover greed. Because I believe greed blinds people from so much. According to the dictionary, greed is this. Greed is excessive or rapacious uh, desire. Rapacious simply, simply means uh, giving to seizing for plunder, all right? That's what greed is, especially for wealth or possessions. And we, I think, in terms of know what, I think everybody in this room perhaps knows what greed means. But there is an, an, an ebullient uh, desire for wealth. There is. There's such a drive for people to become wealthy, to become prosperous. And I'm not against wealth. I'm not against prosperity. I'm not against money. But I am to the point where we need to realize that life is more than just substance or sustenance. Life is more than that because I've done almost a hundred funerals in the last, I don't know, 30 years <laughs> of ministry. And everyone that I have, uh, funeral that I have officiated, not one person or persons were able to take anything with them. And so, First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all evil. Now look at the next part of this verse. It says, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, sometimes I think we, we read our Bibles way too fast. Because do you realize that according to this scripture, coveting money will lead you away from God and into more stress? exactly what it's saying is saying as which while some coveted after or were greedy for they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows causing lots of confusion and a lots of stress well what is covetous covetous is this it is inordinate an inordinate desire of wealth or possessions inordinate means the inability to control all right, inordinate desire of wealth and possessions. Well, covetous is greed. So the Bible doesn't necessarily come out and say greed is sinful, but it does talk about covetousness. And so, I, I, Sister Linda Wallen, I wanted to see a passage of scripture that really resonates with this subject of greed. Where are we right now as a nation? Where are we today as a church that has been in, impacted by some of the ruthless decisions that these political leaders and business leaders and even um, Hollywood stars, whoever they may be, making these decisions for becoming a voice for me, which they have no, uh, they desire, they have really honestly, they have no, there should be no reason that somebody else speaks up for you. You should be able to speak up for yourself. But some people think that we are not intelligent enough, that the church is not smart enough to speak up for themselves. But so I wanted to know, where are we at? And the passage of Scripture, and it's lengthy, but this is where we are at as a nation. And sadly, unfortunately, the church is in, this, in the midst of this too. Are you ready? If you are, say, I'm ready. Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. It'll be on your screen. The Apostle Paul's writing to Roman. Boy, does he write right off the bat in chapter 1, verse 21. He says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, 
but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, black backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that which they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Well, that is powerful. I look at that, I look at that entire uh, passage of Scripture, and I'm thinking, this is exactly where we're at. And you may be sitting in your pews and you're saying, oh, this, will, this is not anything, you know. I'm, I mean, this is, this is New Orleans. This is San Francisco. This is New York City. This is Washington, D.C. This also was Jonesboro, Arkansas on Main Street last night. And so the idea of, of putting our head into the sand and thinking it will never happen home, at home is such a mendacious uh, thought. It is a lie. We must speak up. And the truth is this, judgment is coming. Nobody wants to hear that, but judgment is coming. It's coming swift, it's coming fierce, and it's coming for what you think is your money. All that I have is God's. I was thinking about uh, the other day, I was doing some yard work and I was looking at the, how the Lord has blessed us with a beautiful home. And I, and I sit back and I look at the things that, you know, you have to do to keep your home looking nice in the yard work. And, and I just kept thinking to myself, I said, God, this is not mine. This is not ours. This is yours. Everything that I have, it's all yours. Everything that you've given to us is all yours. And this is, where the, this is where people are living today. They are deceived into thinking that even the money they have is their money. But it's God's money. Because see, I'm sowing into the kingdom of God, not into this economy. If I was sowing into this economy, I would be up at night every night wondering what is going to happen with, with my investments. Amen? And so, judgment's coming. But let me tell you this. Judgment is coming with a purpose. It is coming for a purpose. It has a re there's a redemptive purpose in judgment at all times. We need to realize that. I mean, judgment will begin at the house of God, and we're seeing it. But there's a redemptive purpose behind the judgment of God. He's not here to just to strike you down. He's not here to just to make, you know, thinking that, oh, he's mad at you. That's not the idea. He wants, to, wants you to know that he loves you. And he wants the best for you. And that is the truth. The purpose is this. He wants us to repent of our greed. People are greedy. People are greedy. And if we're not careful, we can be greedy. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Man, this is amazing, isn't it? To look at what God is saying in Scripture. 
And so I here at the last minute today, I, I'm, I had left out a passage that I really wanted to share with you. And it's in Luke uh, chapter 12. And I did put it on a screen, fellas, so you can look it up. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. This is what it says. He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth, his plent or brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This is what I'll do. I will pull down my barns, and I'll build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul! <laughs> Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Look at verse 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Verse 21. So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Wow. You know, that puts life in such a greater perspective. And I think today that people are blinded successfully. It's the truth. And this is some of our points that we said last week. Number one, we said success may be God's act of kindness to you, but not His blessings on you. It may be God's act of kindness, and there's a reason behind that. Remember, we talked about how Moses struck the rock when God told Moses, speak to the rock, but Moses took his staff and he struck it twice and water still came out. If you'll continue to read, Brother John, if you continue to read that scripture about Moses, there's a reason the water gushed out. It wasn't because of the act of disobedience that Moses did, but it was because God still showed mercy to the children of Israel for they needed something to drink. So this brings me to this point. Don't be fooled by the gushing water. You may be thinking today, well, I can just live my life. I'm making good money. All these things are working out. My health is good. But you're drifting from God. And it's God's act of kindness that allows you to continue to prosper, to be successful, but there's something that's more important than just success, and that is your soul. What's well, it profit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? This brings me to number two. When you see the blessings of God on your life while you're living in compromise or sin, it is not God's approval. It is His kindness that you should have the result of repentance and not spiritual death. So God loves us so much and He gives us so much grace and mercy to give us a season, a time, a span of time to repent. To say, okay God, you're speaking to me. I've been greedy. I've been an individual that just wants and just wants to store and store and I'm not giving to the church. I'm not giving my time, my life, the money, whatever it may be. I'm not, I'm not following on in the purpose or the election or the call that you have uh, stamped upon my life. And I need, I need to do that. And that will be up to be between you and God, whether you follow on and to know Him and to live for Him. Look at our scripture in Judges 14, our opening text. It says, Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and he told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren and among all thy, my people that thou goest to take wife of an, the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Samson <laughs> in his excessive, greedy, covenants, rapacious desire, still, he didn't hear a word what his mom or his father, uh, his mother or his father said. He still wanted that woman, Philistine woman. Remember, success is not always God's endorsement of your life, right? Samson's, if you remember, <clears throat> his first love was a Philistine woman from Timnath. 
We taught last Sunday that Samson lusted after a prostitute, and then at midnight <laughs> took the pillars and the walls and the bars and took them all the way up to a Hebron, carried them perhaps 20 miles, nobody knows for sure, but thousands of pounds. And then we read the next scripture, he falls in love with Delilah. <laughs> So before the prostitute, before Delilah, there was this woman from Timnath. The Israelites and the Philistines were, na were national enemies at this time. And according to Hebraic law, it was forbidden for Israelis to marry idolaters or foreigners. So this is the Samson's mother, Samson's father, trying to convince Samson, hey, look, you need to marry within our nation, but you want a woman outside of our nation. So we can assume that seeking a Philistine wife, that Samson was treading on very dangerous water. This is something I want you to get right now in your spirit. It needs to be reiterated. It needs to echo behind the sacred desk in God's temples. Is this truth? National laws, civil laws, even ceremonial laws, and moral laws are not all the same. That is the truth. And I know people, just because this nation has legalized an abomination and said it's okay for same-sex marriage, does not mean it's biblically okay. And that's where we need to understand. And now as you see states like Washington and Oregon and, and Colorado that have been pushing the um, horrible, legalizing these horrible drugs and saying, oh, it's okay, it's legal. You can smoke it, you can shoot it up, you can do all these things. It is what Isaiah is saying, calling evil good and calling good evil does not make it okay, even if it's a national law or a civil law, even a ceremonial law. So what we learn here is this. God's divine prohibition from such an alliance was appealed. There's a reason that God says, okay, we're going to, because you'll see what happens here in Judges 14 and verse 4. Look at this. It's so amazing. Look at the next verse. It says, but his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord. Wow. That he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. And so God was allowing, even though Samson is blind to his desires, God is allowing this to take place because God had a bigger plan in mind. Even in the midst of our blinded success, God is working. God is working. And you may be going down the wrong road and making horrible decisions. And you're wondering, why is this? Why am I allowed to do this? And you're, and you're justifying all the decisions that you've made. And God is saying, but I've got a bigger plan. I've got a greater plan in mind. Something is about to take place in Samson's life. See, God, seeing Samson's choice determined to bring good out of Samson's choices. And this is the truth. This is a spiritual truth. When God is determined, he will succeed even if you don't. Oh, wow. God determined that Samson's attachment to the Philistine woman of Timnath would make for the deliverance of Israel. See, there's a bigger, there's a bigger plan. Yet, Samson's excessive Rapacious, covetous, greedy, desired, continued. And let me show you in Scripture. Greed, and this is the truth. Greed, Brother Ken Talley, greed always wants more. It's never satisfied. It is never satisfied. And so here we go. Judges chapter 14. Let's continue to read this chapter. Verse 5, it says, Then, when Samson, then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath, and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Look at this, the Spirit of God is with Samson. 
And he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. By the way, kid does not mean child, human child. It means a, a goat, a baby goat, okay? So none of you kids get a little nervous right now, all right? Look at verse 7. And Samson went down and talked with this woman, this Timnath woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and his mother, and he gave them, and they did eat both he, but he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. What is happening here? Samson is driven. He's greedy. He's hungry. The honey is not the problem. Look at your neighbor and tell him, hey honey. <laughs> the honey's not the problem. At times the honey may be the problem. But in this, in this, <laughs> in this story this morning, the honey is not the problem. It is the overconsumption of the honey. He's getting this honey out of this line and he's eating and he's eating and he's eating and he's giving it to his mother and his father and they're eating and they're eating. Look what the scripture says. Proverbs 25 and verse 16. Has thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit. Oh my Lord. What is God speaking to you right now? Is there something in your life that you know you're over-consuming? You see, God has a way of, of coruscating those things within us and teaching us, hey, these are things that you have to deal with. Because the Word tells us about a fruit of the Spirit that is not mentioned much, but it's called temperance. <laughs> And if we're going to be a good soldier, we're going to learn to be temperate in all things. Look at the next scripture, Proverbs 25 and verse 7, or 27. It said, it's not good to eat much honey, eat, to eat much honey. So for men to search their own glory is not glory. So what is Samson doing here? We're backtrack. We're seeing the life of Samson. We're seeing these decisions that he's making. And it's leading him to the lap of Delilah. It's leading him to literally become blind. Blinded success. Samson eating honey would become the foreshadow of his blinded success. They gushed out his eyes, and we'll be talking about that in a few weeks. So where is greed evident in our life? Where is greed evident in our life? Right now, where is greed evident? Where are we going blind? Remember, blinded success is the inability to see God's truth in the midst of our prosperity. Here are five things. I'm not going to go through each one. I'm going to give you the list. Take your, your smartphone out. Take a picture of it, okay? This is your, these are the five things. Areas that we become greedy that I believe God is putting his finger on. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. Here we go. Put them up there, or Caleb. Money, time, affection, purpose, and pleasure. Where are, have become evident that we have become greedy, I believe, are these five areas that are in our life. So how do I apply this to my life? So what, now what? How do I go from auditing this message to applying it to my life? How do I go from description to prescription? How can I make this message, blinded success, count for life? Remember our life point? Success is not always God's endorsement of you and your life. That is our life point. I want to tell you a story. This is a true story. It's fascinating. It was in the, some of the Christian publications. When I first heard this story, I said, wow, look at God. I'm going to share this with you. And then again, I'll share it with you next Sunday. 
A Philadelphia Baptist pastor was speaking at a Pentecostal college in the Northeast. He was a Baptist pastor who believed in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but had never experienced them before. And before he preached, eight men met him in a room and asked him to kneel. He said, I'm glad to have prayer, but each of them prayed so long. And the longer they prayed, the more they pushed his head over, and the more he felt he was going to fall out, this Baptist pastor. At times, he said, the men started to wonder in their prayers. In fact, he said one guy started praying for some other guy and not him. The guy prayed and prayed and prayed. He heard this one fellow pray this prayer, and it went, Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stovish. He lives in a silver trailer down the road one mile. You know the trailer, Lord, just down from the school on the right side. The Baptist pastor wanted to interrupt him and say, God knows where he lives. You should be praying for me. Not Charlie, but this guy continued to pray. Lord, Charlie told me this morning that he was going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something. Bring the family back together. And with that, the prayer ended. The Baptist pastor went on to preach at the Pentecostal College Chapel, and everything went well. He got in his car to make his hour drive home, and as he began to drive home on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, he saw a hitchhiker and felt compelled to pick him up. They drove a few minutes, and the Baptist pastor introduced himself and asked the hitchhiker what his name was. And the hitchhiker said, my name is Charlie Stovish. The Baptist pastor immediately exited at a turnpike, turned around, and began driving back to the school. The man said, hey, mister, where are you taking me? And the Baptist preacher said, I'm taking you home. Charlie said, why? The preacher said, because you just left your wife and three kids. Charlie said, yeah, that's right. Charlie planted himself against the passenger side of the car because he was afraid to get close to this Baptist preacher. The Baptist preacher drove right to the silver trailer, one mile from the school, on the right-hand side. And Charlie asked, how did you know I lived here? And the Baptist preacher said, God told me. That day, that Baptist preacher led Charlie Stovish and his wife to the Lord. The best way to make true application of this message is to realize this. You'll never forget this. Realize that money greed, time greed, affection greed, purpose greed, and pleasure greed will pre prevent you from God's best. If that Baptist pastor thought, I don't have the money, I don't have the time, I don't care, I'm, on, I'm only called to preach, or I want to get home to watch television, Star Charlie Stovish, his wife, those three children, would have never known the Lord that day. Let me ask you this question as you stand to your feet. If someone's eternity depended upon your successful overcoming of greed, what kind of future would they be facing? Maybe there's a Charlie Stovish that lives next to you. Maybe there's a Charlie Stovish that is at your work. Maybe you have a relative, a Charlie Stovish. But time is more important to you. Perhaps even your <laughs> reputation you think is more important to you. See, greed goes beyond just money and materialism. I believe God is speaking to us today. See, I don't understand 
how we can call ourselves believers and Christians and never make time for the church. Never make time for one another. People are hurting. There's needs in this facility. I don't, I don't understand that. And I believe God is putting his finger on us. It's called blinded success. It's the inability to understand and see through our prosperity to see God's truth. Because all we have is souls. It's that, it's that little, little bitty two-year-old baby that walked a quarter mile up a dirt road, sat at my feet while I'm mixing up cement and pouring a floor in a little feeding center in Honduras. And me looking and wondering, where did this little girl come from? And thinking to myself, I've been too busy. I've been wrapped up in all, the, all these other things that really doesn't matter as much when there's little bitty girl from Honduras away from her parents just wants something to eat. Maybe God is saying to you and I, in our prosperity we become so blind that we're missing, we're missing the opportunities to feed the hungry. Let's bow our heads and our hearts this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you so much, Lord, for this word. We thank you for the truth of this word, God, because I believe today that you are dealing with us in the issues not only of our money, our time, our affection, our purpose, our pleasure. Father, you're dealing with us, God, about who we've become. We need, we need to make things right before you. So we come to you, God, and ask you to forgive us where we fail so many times before. Where I failed, God, so many times before. Where I even allowed the disembarkment syndrome, my inability to, to have a normal life over the past two and a half years now, to get in a way, to define me, because that's not who I am. I'm your child. I'm a chosen person. And so, Father, forgive me, and I repent of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me, God, through your blood and through your mercy and through your grace. Knowing that even in the midst of my uh, imbalance, the dizziness that I suffer with every day, that I know that you're with me and you're walking with me. Help me, God. Wash me. Wash my eyes. Let me to see. Lead me to see. And let me see your truth. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. How many received that today? Let's, let's thank the Lord today for His blessings. I was in prayer this morning. I don't know who you are, but I know that you're here. You don't have to identify yourself, but I want you to know this. When I was praying for the service today, and I was praying for, for all of the people that would be here, the Lord spoke to me some things. But He said, there's someone that would be here this morning that has a dream, that has a that really has a desire, a dream, whether it is to go back to school, I don't know what it is, but it's something that you've desired for a long time, but you've given up on it. But know this, God said to tell, to tell you today, don't, don't give up. Don't quit. Believe God. He sees, He knows, let him believe in him have faith in him that the work that he began in your life years ago perhaps that he will bring it to pass don't lose hope today keep striving for that goal that dream whatever it may be i don't know who you are 
But know this, you came here today for this Cheyenne Arapaho pastor to tell you, don't quit. Still believe in God and get ready to see that dream fulfilled. You believe that? Shout hallelujah. Praise God. Let's say our Arianic Konin blessing. First we'll say it in Hebrew and then we'll say it in English. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine His face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you and give you peace. Arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and His glory shall be seen upon thee. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you Wednesday, 6 o'clock.